I'm Pat Patterson. I'm a developer evangelist. I'm actually a Salesforce.com employee. So Salesforce is Heroku's parent company. And I surf the uh, boundary between uh, Salesforce and Heroku. My particular focus is on integration and identity. So I do a lot of work on how to access uh, one environment from the other and how to integrate them. So uh, this is not a pitch for Heroku. Um, I think Micah in the last session, if you were in that last session, um, probably talked more about Heroku in that session than I will in this one. What I'm really going to talk about is how to access real world RESTful APIs from a Clojure application. And in particular, some of the um, identity related issues uh, in doing so. So this is a kind of synthetic problem. I'm writing some kind of tool in Clojure. So it could be sales analysis. That kind of fits well with Salesforce. It could be, could be any kind of analysis tool, anything where Clojure is a great fit. You want to maybe pull data from several uh, sources and combine it, that kind of thing. I want to retrieve CRM data from Salesforce via uh, the REST API. It makes it really easy to do so. And I'm going to distribute my app to Salesforce customers. You know, Salesforce has 100,000 customers. It's a great market to sell an app into. And um, I don't really want to be dealing with those customers' passwords. Okay, That's, If they're giving my app their password, they're not going to feel very uh, comfortable. And I need some way to access my, my customer's information in force.com. So that's the synthetic problem. What the real problem was, was when Heroku introduced their Clojure support, my boss told me, Pat, can we call the REST API from Clojure? So having not touched a Lisp-like language since 1989 or so in college, um, I picked up Clojure last year. and. It, it was great. I was up till um, like 2 a.m. the next morning hacking stuff out and getting stuff working because this was just like, wow, it's like being back in college without the beer. So I'm British. I'm allowed to drink beer in college just so we're all legal. So, so we've got this problem. Um, we want to access uh, data in a RESTful API. We've got to do so in the context of a user, and we really don't want to be handling those user credentials. We do, I've seen some horrible things. I've seen people um, screen scraping login pages and uh, plucking the cookie out of the response in order to then call APIs. It's, it's horrible. Don't do it. Um, how many people in the room have heard of OAuth? Oh, awesome. OK, we can skip really quickly through this. So OAuth. Um, Open authorization, okay, that's important. It's not authentication. Authentication is kind of out of scope. It's about authorizing an application to access APIs on behalf of a user. Currently, it's still an internet draft. The committee promised it's going to be an RFC real soon now. We're on draft 23. But even in draft form, it's really widely deployed. So uh, Salesforce deployed draft 10 about the same time as Google did so. And uh, Facebook have deployed draft 20. So it's pretty stable. Not a lot changes from draft to draft. And even in that early form, it was very usable. So who here worked with OAuth 1.0? OK, you've still got the scars. So OAuth 1 was very functional, and it, it fulfilled the same use case. But it was kind of awkward to use. You had to construct a signature for requests going to the authorization server. And there's a lot of hassle. And getting these digital signatures working um, was a big problem. And one of the um, ch big changes in OAuth 2 is that you basically, you can still do signatures if you want to, or you can push all of that security stuff down to the transport layer. So we get some nice interactions with the authorization server that are very simple and basically just punt the security down to SSL, the fact that this is all take it, uh, going over an encrypted channel. So some OAuth jargon. Uh, the user is the user. That's easy enough. Now, the application that's accessing the, these APIs is called the client. Um, 
You have the resource server, so that's where the stuff is that you want to get to, uh, typically implementing the API. So in our case, um, that could be CRM data or other kinds of business data. In Facebook's case, um, that's the graph API. So all your lists of friends and photos and so on. And then typically, you have um, an authorization server that's separate from that resource server. So um, that's the typical pattern that we see. So the user authenticates to the authorization server. That's holding the user accounts. Authorization server issues tokens to that client application that can then use the token to access the data at the resource server um, on behalf of the user. And so there's a trust, necessarily there's a trust relationship between the resource server and the authorization server. The authorization server trusts, the resource server trusts the authorization server to authenticate users and ask their permission to access data and issue tokens. And um, I'm going to spend a couple of minutes running through the, the flow of how OAuth works, because if you understand what's going on, you'll have a lot better time implementing it in, uh, in applications. So let's imagine we've got a client application, and one of the canonical uh, use cases here is, say, a photo, photo printing application. So it needs to access your photos at some photo website, let's say Yahoo. So our client app is Photo Prints R Us, and our resource server is Yahoo. Now, the user at his browser issues some request, get something, do something, whatever, to the client app. And to satisfy this request, the client app needs access to those pictures. Maybe he wants to get a, a preview of his, of his picture in uh, the photo printing website. So the browser sends some request in the context of the client app, the photo printing website. And what's going to happen here is the client app's going to think, well, I need to get that data from resource server, but I have no token for this guy right now. So I'm going to redirect the browser, standard 302, to the authorization server. So there's a little bit of knowledge required by the client app here. The client app has to be written to talk to um, a given API, a given authorization server. There's some, you know, you've got to know this kind of stuff in advance. And indeed, you have to have um, credentials issued, issued by the authorization server for the client app. But what happens is you get a redirection, and you say response type equals code, so I need an authorization code. And here's my client ID, so you, you, you can log this, and you know I'm legitimate. And here's the URL that I want you to redirect back to when you're done authenticating the user. So now authentication takes place between the authorization server and the user via his browser. Now, this is, this is key. This, this authentication is out of scope of OAuth. It doesn't matter how you do it. To, uh, often, it's username password. You could do SAML to send the user somewhere else to authenticate. So that's what we do quite often. Um, you want access to your records in Salesforce, and Salesforce delegates authentication back to the company that you work for, where you have an account. And then you come back. And uh, we know who you are. So absolutely anything. You could be using hardware tokens. But the point is that at some point, the authorization server knows that you are Bob, and uh, you're going to, going to allow this application to access your data. So now we just redirect back to uh, that URL that we passed with a code. Now, this is a very short-lived code. It goes across as a query parameter. So the problem with query parameters is that they get logged every step of the process. And they appear in the browser URL bar. And they're kind of available to JavaScript if there's any holes anywhere. So well, this is a very short-lived token that enables the client app to then post over SSL to the authorization server and say, OK, um, here's my authorization code. Uh, here's, it, I'm, here's its value. This is my ID. This is my secret, so a shared secret between the client app and the authorization server. And yeah, here's that redirect URI that we, were to we, that we talked about earlier. So now, this is taking place over a direct SSL connection from the client app 
web app or whatever to the authorization server. And so authorization server can issue an access token. So this is kind of equivalent to a session cookie. Typically, it has validity of the order of hours, where the code is you know, maybe a minute or less. And it's got token type bearer. So this is a bearer token. Whoever holds the, this token can access the API on behalf of that user. Okay, So it's not like there's a got to be a cryptographic relationship between um, uh, the message and some key. You've got to protect this access token. Okay, Treat it like a session cookie. Um, look after it. And in particular, don't give it to the browser. Okay, Store it in the HTTP session or whatever. That's typical on for that client app where it's a web app. So now my app can get data from the resource server passing along that access token in the standard HTTP authorization header. So this is essentially just a standard HTTP request with that authorization header in it. There's no magic. You could, in fact, you're not even limited to uh, HTTP. That's just the most common case for RESTful APIs. You could pass this token in uh, as a query parameter, in, in, as part of a SOAP request, um, just anywhere where you need that kind of secure access. So now the resource server is able to uh, look at that token. That token might have meaning encrypted into it. It might have to go back to the authorization server to verify. It doesn't really matter. Um, it's that just, that's just an opaque string as far as the standard and as far as the client app is concerned. But the point is that the client app, so photo sharing website goes to resource server, Yahoo, whoever, to bring back that photo and just passes the token and gets back the data and then is ultimately able to satisfy the user's request. So there's quite a lot going on there. And when I originally did this work, I coded all this up in Clojure myself. And then as I was preparing for this session, I came across something called CLJ OAuth2. And being a good open source citizen and seeing that uh, Moritz Heidkamp of do.net had done more work than I had, and it actually looked like he had more of a clue about closure than I had, which was not a high bar to clear. I thought, well, I'm going to use this and see if I can get it working with uh, force.com, with that Salesforce's uh, API. Now, it was clear from a look at the code that his initial implementation worked with uh, Facebook, which used a different um, draft of the OAuth2 spec. So I had a little bit of work there to do, a little bit of tweaking some little differences. But uh, I got it working, and it's, it's a really nice piece of code. So if we step through the part, the, what you would need to do from your Clojure application, first of all, you're going to need to do some configuration. Now, basically, you've got to just create this uh, map. And uh, there's a few things you have to pass. You have to pass the endpoints where you send the user to do that authentication, authorization step. And you have to set the endpoint where I'm going to post the code to get back that token. The redirect URI of my own app, where I want the user to come back to with that, with that code. And my, uh, the credentials I share with, with the service, with uh, the auth authorization server. And this grant type, there's a few variants of OAuth2. What I described is uh, what you would do in a web server. You can also do things uh, like for mobile applications and so on that use different grant types. But in this case, it's authorization code. So it's pretty easy to get this working on Heroku. Oh, I mentioned it. Um, you typically read these from environment variables. You know, you keep, uh, if, if there's one thing that you remember, only one thing you remember from this session, don't put credentials in your source code. OK, read them from a config file, read them from the environment. But um, if you put credentials in your source code, you'll push your source code to GitHub, and then it's just a bad day. So this runs, yeah, this is client code. So this is you're building a client web server application in Clojure to um, 
to access data at some API. So to implement this redirect, what I do is I, in the OAuth2 library, make an auth request uh, with those, that configuration, force.com, OAuth2, and we pass a string that we should randomly generate to mitigate cross-site request forgery attacks, okay? We don't want a bad actor injecting himself into the middle of this process and giving the user um, his own uh, auth authorization code. Bad stuff can happen, basically. So we, we have a randomly generated string here that we can, we can check later when we get a response. So that process basically makes, um, makes another map and we just redirect the browser to the URI from that map. So control goes over to uh, the auth authorization server, the user um, authenticates, typically the user clicks through an authorization to say app XYZ wants to access your data on your behalf and control comes back to us. So we are with this one here. So we're here. Now um, we just got a request. It's got a bunch of stuff on it. And in my closure app, I don't particularly, I'm not really interested in what's going on here. So the CLJ OAuth2 just <laughs> gives me this method, um, this function get access token. So I pass in that configuration again. I pass the params that came in with that get request. So we're kind of in ring land here. And I also pass in the auth request that I made earlier. And that gives the library everything it needs at this point to go uh, to check that this is the same as the one I sent, okay, because it's got that from authrec, and to post that code over to authorization server and get back the access token. So really, in two calls, it's pretty much run through this whole um, choreography between my app and the um, authorization server. So now once I have this in hand, um, it basically wraps CLJ HTTP. Okay, so I'm going to want to get data from that resource server and pass uh, this authorization, uh, this access token. So it presents a set of uh, functions, get, post, uh, delete, whatever, and so this is how I would get a record from force.com using the library. So OAuth2 slash get, pass the URL that I want to access, and I pass in um, the OAuth2 part of that, uh, sorry, I pass in a map containing that access token as the OAuth2 keyword. So this is really nice. I've uh, got my app working with some API without having to worry about this whole um, redirection soup. I redirected once, I got something back, and the library handled everything else. But I'm still having to manage those redirections. I'm still having to redirect the user away and catch that uh, the callback. So can we abstract those redirections away? So this is where I really kind of stopped um, adapting CLJ OAuth2 to work with force.com and started building on top of it. And it occurred to me that, wow, I, there's a mechanism here that I can intercept the traffic uh, coming into my app and I can um, send requests and intercept the responses if I just write some ring middleware. I'm completely in, uh, in control of the request and response. So in order to get rid of all of that logic, um, I wrote this wrap OAuth2. So who here has worked with Ring and uh, Composure? OK, good number. OK. So what I can do here is just define a handler. So when I try and get this test page, 
my wrapper has added the OAuth2 uh, access token to the request map. So I can just get it out there and start calling um, uh, the get fun you know, start calling those accessor functions to get data back. And down here, what I've done is, you know, I've got a bunch of middleware here, so params, keyword params, session, and I've passed in my wrapper with that with that um, configuration. So what my wrapper is actually doing is catching in this particular configuration, it's catching all access to my website and basically saying, have you got an access token? No. Okay, I'm going to send you over to get one and handle that callback. And then I'm going to inject that access token into the request so that the application code can later just pull it out and do those uh, and do whatever requests it needs of the resource server to, to build a page. Now, that's all, that's all really nice. I, I don't have to worry about this whole redirection soup anymore. It just gets done in the background. But this is still kind of boilerplate-y. You know, every time I have to get something, the, there's a REST API here uh, written in terms of gets and posts and so on. And I kind of have to pass this stuff across every time. And it just, just feels like I could factor out um, a lot of stuff, especially if I have a few of these calls in my app. There's a lot of repeated code. So the next step I took was, okay, I've got this OAuth thing in the request map. Can I wrap my API, the REST API for force.com? And if I have time, oh, I'm not doing too badly for time. I can show you some of the code, but I've just got the, the, the app eye view. And, um, so it turns out that um, what I did was I defined macros to take that OAuth parameter. So you don't, you don't have to pass the OAuth parameter because it's just kind of it's in the environment of the request here and just implemented query, create, retrieve, update, delete to pass in what naturally uh, works with the API. So when I pass in a, when I do a query, I pass in a query string. That's actually SQL, Salesforce Object Query Language. Looks very like SQL, and um, that's it. I get back um, a data structure in response. And when I want to create an account in Salesforce, I just create, say create account name Initech, and it's all very natural because I've just abstracted away that whole OAuth handling stuff. I've got a macro. Actually, let's go to it now. Oh, this has gone weird with the, uh, oh, there we go. So I'm not, I'm by no means a closure expert. So you can do sharp intakes of breath when you see this or whatever. Let's see, uh, let's go for query because that's really simple. So my query macro basically calls a query helper with the OAuth2 that we're assuming is in the request and um, the query that you passed in. So that just basically does it. Force request is just a wrapper around uh, whatever get post. Well, it's actually a wrapper around request. We pass in a get. And that just formats everything up because every query is the same and we want to pull that common code out of the app. So that's, that's the journey that I went along to uh, wrap uh, our API and get it working in Clojure. And Uh, where are we now? And I can show you the, the, the test app that I created. And it, 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 hopefully it will help to kind of solidify what's going on here. So I make a request of the... Um, oh, I was already logged into Salesforce. Never mind. I make a request of my app. Now, it so happens I already have a session. Let me log out of Salesforce because it makes things uh, a bit more obvious. Um, all right, so I make a request to my app. Now, what's happening is that library code redirects the user over to Salesforce. Now, I don't have a session. So Salesforce has no clue who I am, 
and prompts me to authenticate. Now, the key thing here is I'm authenticating directly with Salesforce. Okay, this is what this is why users will use apps that use OAuth, where they'd be less likely to type their Salesforce credentials into some random website or some random uh, desktop application. I demonstrate my inability to talk and type simultaneously. Now, now what happens is the authorization part of OAuth is close your force. This app, okay, Salesforce knows what the app is because I passed that client ID, is requesting permission to access my, in this case, basic information, access and manage my data, perform requests on my behalf at any time. Okay, there's a, a persistent mechanism here as well. Only click allow for applications you trust. Well, I wrote this, so I trust it. I'm not sure if that's actually wise. <laughs> but what we get here is, it's just a very simple um, account viewer. So this is, this is the list of standard uh, test accounts that we get in a, a, a force.com developer edition. But I can go through the CRUD process here. So this is using, um, now how do we pronounce it? On live, in live, the templating. I love that because you write your templates in HTML and it's just beautiful. So we can say uh, closure west it cljw. So we can create that. So that should appear in my list. So, uh, oh, there it is, closure west. So that's create. I can retrieve that. I can edit it. So we. Actually, let's just change the name, then it will appear in the list. So it should. So it's actually, there's no caching going on here. It's actually just hitting the API every time more as a demonstration than anything. So it's there as closure W. And I can go into real heavy duty um, enterprise Salesforce and try not to log in with my actual corporate credential here. That would be bad. But I can go in and I can look at my list of accounts back here in the sales app. And we should see that Closure W. So that's my, my most recently created account. So it's really, you know, it's accessing the real Salesforce system. And then, uh, so that's create, read, update. And then we can just close the loop with delete. So in principle, you can apply this to any API that's using OAuth 2. So the big three at the moment are um, Salesforce, Google, and Facebook. And actually, if you want to know more about OAuth 2, Ryan Boyd, one of the dev evangelists at Google, wrote this book, which is 65 pages. So it's a two or three hour read. But that really gives you everything you need to know about OAuth. I'm not being paid commission by Ryan. I just bought it couple of weeks ago and it's uh, a really, really useful tool. But um, but it is possible, as you can see in, yeah, hello? So, sorry, getting started with OAuth 2. There you go. It's got, is that a puffer fish? Something on the front. Hello, yeah. Oh, can you just uh, talk about any other contending um, protocols besides OAuth? Okay, so in the space, where OAuth sits. So uh, backing up a little, so there's a bit of history that I elided in the interest of time. Before the advent of OAuth, every internet provider had their own proprietary way of doing this. So Yahoo had BBAuth, uh, there was OpenAuth from AOL, I think. Google had some similar proprietary API. But they were all solving the same problem. I've got, I've got someone's third party app, I've got resources, and I want to get the user's permission to access these. So with Google, it was often the contacts list. And what was happening was third party websites were screen scraping um, Gmail to get con horrible, horrible things were going on. So Google implemented this API, and then Yahoo implemented their API, and AOL implemented an API, and sooner or later somebody said, stop the madness, because we're all doing exactly the same thing. So OAuth 1 was created. I think Twitter had a pretty big, big hand in that, so Twitter still use OAuth 1, to solve this problem of um, 
you know, securely granting access to my data in, in some other website. Now, since then, you know, the whole industry more or less glommed onto OAuth 1 and then developed it into OAuth 2. And in that particular space, there really isn't a lot of other, a lot of um, competition in terms of protocol. Now, OpenID is another protocol that you might think of in the same space. But really, OpenID and OAuth are orthogonal. So OAuth leaves out that authentication step and basically gives you a mechanism to get a token to access APIs, whereas OpenID focuses completely on that authentication step and lets you uh, authenticate it in one place to access uh, your account, your whatever, a website somewhere else. Now, there are certainly other protocols to do that, so SAML in the enterprise space, <laughs> OpenID is more popular in kind of consumer-oriented space, um, user-centric identity. But in terms of the actual problem of um, getting a token to access APIs, OAuth is, is, is really it. There isn't really a, another game in town, which is good because we don't have to implement the same damn problem several times. Because I, So I worked in SAML as well, and then IBM and Microsoft came up with WS Federation, which did the same thing as SAML, just with a slightly different syntax. And I implemented WS Federation in a Sun product, and it was horrible because I was literally copying the code from SAML and tweaking around and changing stuff because it was just a slightly different syntax and a slightly different flow, and there wasn't enough to really factor it. Oh, it was horrible. So it's a good thing that there really isn't another game in town. OAuth 2, um, and, and you know the industry is moving from OAuth 1 to OAuth 2, and I think as soon as that RFC is published, the, the shoe will drop for a lot of the providers that are still doing OAuth 1. So Twitter's still OAuth 1. I think LinkedIn, mostly OAuth 1, a bit of OAuth 2. Um, but uh, you know, the big, I mean, it's stable enough that um, Google, Facebook, and Salesforce have, have all implemented draft versions of the spec for OAuth 2. So um, what I will show you is we kind of raced ahead to questions, but um, yeah. If you're working with RESTful APIs, you need to grok OAuth 2, okay? If the API you're working with doesn't use it now, it will in the future. Don't code from scratch. When I first started on this nearly a year ago, there was nothing out there, but now there is. So use CLJ OAuth 2, it works well. Um, it works, I know it works with Facebook and Salesforce. It should work with Google as well because they use the same draft that we do. If it doesn't quite work for what you're trying to use it for, um, fork it and send Moritz a pull request. So that's exactly what I did. I'm actually working with Moritz on getting my changes pulled back into the core CLJ OAuth 2. And because uh, Salesforce and Heroku pay for me to be here, um, try out Heroku's closure support, but you already heard that from uh, the last speaker. It really does work well. So this app here that we saw a minute ago is just running on Heroku. Really, really works nicely for, for closure apps. So while I answer more questions, yeah. Um. Could you elaborate more about what, why you needed uh, to define a macro? And, and so I could, I could do it without a macro, but then every time I called one of those, uh, one of those like query or create or whatever, I had to have to pass the same OAuth parameter. And I'm lazy and I don't like typing very much, so I created a macro because I could assume that that was going to be in the request, and it just kind of... The macro expands into, like, so in the case of query, yeah, yeah, exactly. So there's a macro called query, and that expands into query helper with that OAuth. See here? So query expands into query helper with the OAuth2 uh, symbol. If you, if you look at partial, maybe, is, 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 that, a, is that an option to... It may be. It may be. That's partly why I came here, to get ideas on making this better. Yeah, that might be partial. Okay. 
Uh, yeah. This, this is maybe more an OAuth question. Mm -hmm. Maybe this is a very seldom use case, if ever. Are there cases where a client wants authorization to more than one other? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Is that built into the OAuth standard? Or, um, or is it change, how does it change that flow that you So, what? So that's that's a really so the question is what if you want to access more than one API via OAuth, and really there's nothing that stops you. you you're just responsible as the application for doing that yourself. So it's not like the library has. Um, you know, it's not like there's some setting in the library that that gets some static or something like that that gets set when you do that. Um, authentication, you're holding all the parameters that you pass across so that, you know, this OAuth thing that I'm kind of hiding away here um, is what I hold when I do that. Um, I've not done it, so yeah, that's interesting. That might uh, upset um, the way this works. I might need to think a little bit more about that. I've certainly done it in other languages where I need to, uh, so I did a Facebook app so you get uh, you you basically do OAuth with Facebook. Every time you um, authorize a Facebook app to get your basic data and your profile, that's OAuth. Okay, that's exactly what's happening. And so I coded that side with Facebook, and then the other side, OAuth has a password flow. So my app has its own identity with Force.com and is accessing data. So I was doing. Um, like a front end and a back end, but you can also do things like link accounts. So I might have a Facebook account and a Salesforce account, and I might want to start, uh, say, looking at my business contacts and see if they're Facebook friends or LinkedIn contacts. That's probably more relevant. So absolutely, you, you as the programmer, there's nothing in the protocol that stops you from doing that. So, and then you. Again, I didn't get time to go that deep, but you can get a, a persistent token called a refresh token that, again, the user is giving you the ability to go back in another session and exchange that persistent token for another session token and access the data. So that's why sometimes with Facebook apps it says this, this app has the ability to access your data when you're offline. Okay, so that's what's going on there that, you know, on another visit or even when you're not even there, it can get another access token and start uh, accessing your data. So as an app, what you would do is just collect refresh tokens for the various services, and then you're basically just associating those in your view of the user, and you can pull that data together and build some consolidated view. Um, name escapes me now, but there's, a, there's an add-on for Gmail that pulls your contacts data from LinkedIn and Twitter and everywhere else, and that's essentially what's happening there. They're, they're just using, they're just accessing different APIs, and somewhere they've got a mapping between, uh, you know, you and your tokens for these different APIs. Yeah. Are permissions communicated at all, such as you can read but you can't write? Or so yeah, there's the there's the notion of scope. Um, so when you request that authorization, so in that very first step you can pass uh, an optional scope parameter. So usually there's some notion of default scope. So with Facebook, everybody understands Facebook. Um, if you don't pass scope, then the app gets access to your basic information and your friends list, but notably not your email address. Okay, so you have to, to if, you, if an app wants to get your email address from Facebook, it has to say scope equals email, in which case it gets your basic, your friends list, and your email address. And then there's a whole, there's something like 30 or 40 separate scope parameters. You can pass a comma separated list to say, oh, I, can't, I want to see your photos, I want to see your likes, I want to see your gender, you know, yada, yada, yada. You, can, you, you basically construct this thing. But here's the interesting thing with doing this, because we kind of get into privacy and identity here. Um, the more you ask the user for, the more the risk that they're going to drop off at that point and say, well, I'm not, I'm not going to share all of this with this app. Well, why does this app need my friend's photos? Um, so there's always a trade-off here. You know, you're, you're accessing um, users' private, in some cases, information. You're asking the user for permission to access all that information. And you've really got to think hard about the minimal set that you need to access because 
the more you ask for, the more drop off you're going to get in users just saying, oh, no, I'm going to just close this window or cancel and I don't want this link to go, to go ahead. Is it just limited to data or can I say you can read all my data? So, so it's really down to the individual API provider. So, um, so what we're doing, originally uh, we had no scope. You've just got you know, default access and we're adding granularity to the scope over time. So I would expect that we would be able to say, okay, give this app read-only access to my data. It's a sensible thing to do. But that's always in the context of a particular API because the semantics of, that, of each API are unique. So you know, this gives you a standardized way to manage that conversation, you know, give the user giving that permission. But it's really down to your API whether uh, you know, read-only access makes sense or you know, access my photos but not my videos, you know, whatever level of granularity um, you need to provide. And it can change over time. As I say, we're, we're making scope more granular over time as we understand better. As we hear from our customers, oh, right, it would be really useful to have read-only access to my data. So right now, you can do things like um, you can control via scope whether this token is only, only valid for the API, or you can even push it into a browser session to pop up a browser looking at your Salesforce data. You know, and it's, it's scope that controls what that token is allowed to do. Okay, any more questions? All right, well, thank you very much. I'll let you get to your coffee now, and uh, thank you for attending. <laughs>